like sunshine, like springtime, like something's in the water and I'm taking a deep dive. I'm feeling so weightless, like I'm gonna make it, and nothing in the universe can take this. I can see it clearly now, nothing gonna bring me down. Welcome to the National University of Singapore Yong Lulin School of Medicine Healthy Longevity webinar. Great to see you and Happy New Year. Uh, our primary speaker today is Dr. Shahaf Pelek uh, with a very special interest. He tries to harness the energy of light and how to translate that light to chemical energy in mitochondria. You might wonder what the relation is with aging. He will tell you all about it and that might trigger questions. So please use the Q&A function to send your remarks, questions, ideas, whatever you want. We start with a short presentation by Anderson Coe today, our research assistant at the Center for Health and Longevity. And he will talk about an important topic, uh, how the long-term exercise effects uh, are related to cognition in healthy individuals. Thank you for the kind introduction. Hi everyone, as mentioned, my name is Anderson and today I will be sharing some recent research insights on the relationship between exercise and cognitive health with you. These results were published by Lediga and colleagues in the journal Nature Human Behavior titled Systematic Review and Meta-Analysis Investigating Moderators of Long-Term Effects of Exercise on Cognition in Healthy Individuals. While it's quite well known that exercising is beneficial to our physical, mental, and cognitive health, the authors of this paper hope to shed some light on how much exercise or what kind of exercise will benefit your cognitive health the most. The inclusion and exclusion criteria stated on this slide were used to help identify studies that exclusively look at the cognitive benefits of long-term exercise. To increase the reliability of this analysis, studies with a majority of subjects that were cognitively unwell were excluded. After multiple screening, the final review included 80 studies, all of which were randomized control trials, where participants were randomly allocated into the control group which in this context would be the absence of exercise and the experimental group where participants exercised. The outcome measures of interest in this study is cognitive function. And while the study looked at many independent variables and their relationship with cognitive functioning, I will be focusing on those parameters, types of exercise and intensity of exercise. Let's start off with those parameters. In this paper, those parameter refers to the length of each exercise session, as well as the number of weeks exercised. In other words, how much exercise one did. What they found was that if one does a short 30 minutes exercise over a year, the benefits to the brain will gradually become lesser than the one hour exercise group. But if one does an average of 1.5 hours for a year, the benefits to brain function increases much more. They also noted the intersection between these graphs are at around 22 weeks, meaning when an exercise is sustained for more than 22 weeks, a longer session duration, such as the 90 minutes workout, will show greater effects on cognitive functioning. Next, we'll look at the type of exercise and their effects on cognitive function. This review looked at these four types of exercises. From the meta-analysis of the studies included in this review, 
all exercise types appeared to be effective. However, coordinative exercise did seem to promise more pronounced cognitive enhancements. The analysis also found an interaction effect between sex and exercise type, suggesting less noticeable cognitive benefits for all exercise type except coordinative exercise in studies with majority female participants. However, this is not direct conclusion that female participant has lesser exercise-induced cognitive benefits. The authors of this paper have suggested that the differences might be attributed to indirect factors related to gender, such as a greater engagement in exercise among male individuals and greater increase of general physical activity and healthy behaviors when compared to their original lifestyles. Finally, we'll look at the intensity of exercise. The analysis found no evidence in main effects of exercise intensity and intensity progression on exercise-induced cognitive benefits. Meaning, as long as you exercise, the intensity of exercise does not matter that much. All exercise intensity will benefit your cognitive function more or less equally. Having that said, exercising at vigorous and high intensity has been found to have lesser exercise-induced cognitive benefits when intensity progression studies consisted of a higher proportion of female participants. To explain this observation, the authors have suggested that physiological differences between the sexes might have caused female participants to overexert themselves and offset the cognitive benefits of long-term exercise, as demonstrated in past studies for the effects of overtraining. A summary of key findings from this review. The meta-analysis indicates a small but significant positive effect of exercise on cognitive function in healthy individuals. For greater cognitive benefits, you should do more coordinative exercise and exercise regularly for longer durations rather than at high intensity. Finally, since there's no main effect for intensity progression, female participants can potentially benefit most from low to moderate exercise intensity without the need for progression. Hope you have found this information helpful. And with this quote, I end my presentation. Thank you for tuning in. Thank you, Anderson. I'm not sure now if I have to use the treadmill tonight, but um, I think we should discuss that. But over to our primary speaker, Dr. Shahab Pelek received his bachelor from the Ben Gurion University in Israel in 2006 and his PhD from, he moved then to Germany, to Göttingen um, in 2010. He then um, did research in, uh, at the Max Planck Institute. And no, that's not right. I'm very sorry. You went to Göttingen and then you went to Munich. That was the, the right way where you also did your PhD. Very sorry for that. Um, and in 2018, he went and set up his laboratory at the FBN, and that's the Research Institute for Farm Animal Biology. And he is mainly working with flies, and not only with the mice, but with giant mice to understand molecular changes associated with the aging process. But uh, recently, he really is interested in energy replacement. Whatever that is, we will hear everything about it. Um, and he really tries to understand how that energy can be used to make us younger. So over to you, uh, uh, Shahaf, to hear how you are going to enlighten us. Thank you very much, Andrea, for this introduction. Can you hear me? Perfectly. Good. And thanks for also uh, testing me if I keep uh, in check what you, how you introduce me on the placement and so on. So um, I thank you very much for the opportunity to give the talk in front of so many people that are interested in aging. And today, as I mentioned, I'm going to talk about some strange energy replacement concept, which I'm pretty sure in 25 to 30 minutes will be clear to anyone. Today, um, I'm trying to have some sort of a different approach. And I'm going to try also to share with you the process of thinking that led me from epigenetics to uh, this strange optogenetic energy replacement. So I just want to quickly uh, share what we are doing in the lab. So as Andrea mentioned, we are working on giant mice. They are called uh, Titan and rock mice. 
Um, they exist only in Dumasdorf and they are a product of 50 years of uh, selection. And the good thing is uh, they are not only giants, they are up to 140 grams. They are also short lived, so you can do a lot of things with them. We also work, we are also working with flies and um, longevity with flies, but also trade-offs of uh, longevity in flies. We work also uh, on boot rate metabolism. And uh, recently uh, we started to work on optogenetics on mitochondria. And I'm going to talk somehow on the touch between the fly work and this um, light optogenetic project. Um, so uh, when I was a PhD student, I was very interested in aging. And I looked uh, at this paper uh, from Bruce Yankner lab. And what they did is something very simple. They took um, brain tissue from different uh, people, obviously deceased people between 20 to 100, and they measured the gene expression. And what they found out that um, throughout the axis of aging, many genes are changing. So the, the abundance of many genes are changing. Some go up, some do, go down. And there is a major disruption of uh, the transcriptome, um, which is we all know we all know now is one of the major hallmarks of aging. And I was interested what can cause this huge transcriptomic change throughout aging. And I wanted to notice you don't need to really be 100 or 70 in this beautiful video that you shown in the beginning uh, of what aging looks like. Um, you can see already, unfortunately, in my age around I'm not going to lie, I'm not 35, but throughout more 40, early 40s you can already appreciate the changes. Um, so what can cause these uh, big changes? So I was very interested in epigenetics. I'm not going to talk too much about it, but I need to introduce it to some extent. As we all know, the DNA is not a naked molecule um, that just express genes. Um, there are a lot of genes, there are a lot of proteins that bind with uh, uh, the DNA and change the accessibility of the DNA for transcription from open to closed, meaning you can turn on and off genes. And if you look at one of these proteins, the histones, you can see them here, the histone can have a very dynamic interaction with the DNA. And this is achieved by one of uh, the modifications of the histone tails um, domain. And if I zoom in, you can see it's quite complex. So if you have uh, the histone tails here of the four canonical histones, you can see that these uh, amino acids can be modified by lots of, mo of small molecules. Uh, for instance, here H4 can be modified by a lot of um, modifications from methylation and acetylation and so on. And what's interesting about these molecules is where they come from. And where they come from, they come from central metabolism. So if you look here, for instance, if you want to achieve yeast on acetylation, you need to have a cofactor acetyl-CoA, which is derived by mitochondrial activity. And so there is a lot of connection between metabolism and epigenetics something I discovered only towards the end of my PhD and could have helped me a lot at the beginning. Um, you can also think about epigenetic to some extent as metabolic modifications of proteins and DNA that locally remodel the chromatin or the DNA uh, protein interaction. And so we wanted to check what's up with what's going on with aging, uh, at least in Eastern acetylation. Um, we checked it mostly in cognition, but I'm not going to show it. I'm just going to show a very simple comparison uh, from my PhD work uh, measuring mice, which are three months and 16 months. So not very old, something like around my age, middle age. And, you, and we stained it for histone acetylation. It's called H4K12 acetylation. It's specific histone acetylation. And you can see that um, there is some sort of increase in this brain region of the staining of H4K12 acetylation, which was weird and counterintuitive. Why? First of all, my boss expected the opposite. So obviously it's uh, surprising. And then, uh, as I just mentioned, if you look at the axis of the connect connectivity here, um, to achieve more histone acetylation, you also need to have more acetyl-CoA and maybe uh, upstream increase metabolic activity, which is not what you expect in aging. In, in fact, in aging, you would expect lower metabolic activity. But this was one of the first weird results that uh, suggested maybe metabolism has some sort of strange or more complex change along the axis of aging. So when I did my uh, postdoc, I wanted to focus more on metabolism, epigenetic connectivity. And I looked uh, at the literature and I saw some sort of um, disagreement, let's call it. Um, a lot of studies indicate that aging is associated with metabolic decline. But on the other hand, a lot of studies show that if you target metabolism and decrease it or rewire it, re 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 it and decrease it, um, you actually have an extension of lifespan. And um, that's kind of doesn't really fit. 
why aging is associated with metabolic decline, but further declining metabolism increased lifespan. Um, we're not going to solve this answer here, but I would like to say that a lot of the studies here are reviews that cite reviews and cite reviews, and it's not so easy to find um, papers, original papers that actually claim it. So I wanted to test this hypothesis um, or check what's really going on with metabolism in aging, and I use flies that are more short-lived. So um, what I measured is basically how uh, acetyl coa metabolism is changed throughout aging and also metabolism. And here I used a very cool technique that I uh, pioneered. Uh, it's basically instead of using uh, oxygen consumption rates in uh, mitochondria, um, like a lot of other studies are doing, I measured the oxygen consumption rate in a whole tissue. In this case, the whole head. So we separate uh, the head from a fly and we measure oxygen consumption rate. And you can appreciate if you take young versus middle-aged flies, you can see an increase, a uh, significant increase of oxygen consumption rate. Whereas when you look at young versus very old flies, you have a decrease of oxygen consumption rate. And that was already another clue that metabolism might not only decrease throughout aging, maybe at least it's biphasic. So first it's increasing and th then it's decreasing. And we also show that at least in the middle age, uh, some of the key metabolites that I mentioned before, such as acetyl-CoA or citrate uh, that produce acetyl-CoA, um, um, show an increase in the middle age uh, flies, including the enzymes that produce them show higher increased activity. And to consolidate a lot of work uh, in a very long uh, postdoc, I'm going to show this model. And this model is very important to understand uh, how we reach to the light uh, project. So when we are young, uh, that's at least the model that I hypothesize, there is a very nice uh, connection between mitochondrial activity and maintenance of the epigenome. So you produce in mitochondria enough ATP, some of the citrate goes out of the mitochondria, um, uh, and then remade into acetyl-CoA or generate acetyl-CoA, which is used to maintain a uh, uh, healthy epigenome. But when we are old and counterintuitively, I have to stress it again, it seems as if this pathway or this metabolic pathway is increased. And when I say it, it's important to note, I'm not talking there is more ATP. You have more or less comparable ATP in the experiments we have done, but in order to achieve the same amount of ATP, you need to invest more. It seems as if uh, this um, machinery is less efficient. And we think because there are more metabolites, some of them now go maybe unintentionally out of the mitochondria in the form of a steel as I mentioned, and create some epigenetic alterations that you might not even want. And when this is overdrive, you can imagine, and I will give a metaphor very shortly, when this overworks too much, then it starts to get damaged. And then maybe we see this classical metabolic decline in aging, that we don't have enough metabolism activity and we don't have enough um, um, uh, metabolites to maintain an healthy epigenome. And you can make a metaphor here of driving a car. So if you're in Germany and you drive 140 kilometers per hour in, in a very flat highway, everything is fine. But the moment you go south and you cross, try to cross the Alps, to keep the same amount of, of speed, you need to put much more uh, pressure on the gas. But as you do it, the car overheats, creates damage, and eventually, eventually you will break down and you need someone to rescue your car. So I looked at this model and I asked myself a basic question. I'm going to be a group leader. What am I going to do about it? What kind of crazy ideas you can do to target this um, hyperdrive of metabolism? What does it actually mean? So um, I want to turn your attention here to a very nice perspective in nature aging that just came out a few weeks ago. It's very provocative. It basically says there is a limit to maximum lifespan. And the intervention um, that we do, even uh, this nice um, um, sports and exercise, um, there, is an there's, there's no evidence it can really break the glass ceiling in vertebrate aging. And um, that's what uh, the authors claim, that um, we, we don't have this breakthrough to really increase healthy lifespan of human in a meaningful manner. And they put a, a comparison that to other species like whales and other uh, species that are long-lived, and they say, um, if we really want to do this to achieve maximal lifespan increase, we need to do something radical. And at that time, I thought I was already doing something radical. And I asked once in the lab, uh, lab that didn't do aging, I asked, what is your 
crazy ideas to increase lifespan. I asked the students. The students mostly said healthy lifestyle, do more exercise, eat a bit healthy. I wasn't happy with this because this is not what I was looking for. That I know. So I asked, okay, give me something crazy that's never been done before. Like Think out of the box. And now come with these crazy ideas. Uh, take genes from long-lived animals and insert into us. Some complex dr drug cocktail. Putting young blood into us like the vampire myth. Freeze yourself. Uh, someone uh, said, like, I think you watch too much Terminator, like machine human interface uh, that we put some limbs that's made up of metal and so on. And my idea was eating ATP. And, and why is that? I wanted to cheat this whole process. I thought if it takes too much trouble to make ATP, and I, I will show it later, why not just eat ATP? And then the big boss came and said, Shah, what are you talking about? How can you eat ATP? Gave me a lot of reasons. Will not cross the membrane, not stable. And you will need to eat 80 kilos of this a day, which is not feasible even for someone like me. So I didn't give up, but I found a way to maybe tackle it. So I want to give a very short introduction to the light project now. Um, if you look at us, um, a lot of us is designed to acquire food. Look for food, eat it. When we don't eat it, we are angry, not just angry. And a lot of our body design is, uh, is devoted for this. And a lot of our biochemistry is devoted of it, uh, to it. So if you look to your student, you know this better than me. So don't ask me questions about me, about glycolysis and TCA cycle and so on. We take these macromolecules of food that we eat, we break it down. We invest a lot of complex enzymatic activity to generate at the end ATP. And it all boils down to this, the electron transport chain, which is maybe one of the most conserved um, biological pathway that we can think of in eukaryotes. Um, and as you all know, we have these four complexes uh, and what they do, uh, they are coupled with the TCA cycle activity. Um, they create this proton gradient, it's called the PMF, across uh, the intermembrane of the mitochondria. It goes against the gradient, so they increase the gradient. This is where the, uh, the trick is. And then uh, throughout diffusion, basically, the, the, the protons go through this ATP synthase and move it around. And every couple of protons, when they uh, cross the full circle of this ATP synthase, generate ATP. And that's how you do it. So you eat and you generate ATP in this manner. And so what is the rationale to target and even try to partially replace one of the most conserved uh, uh, mechanisms you can think of? And first of all, it's not worth it to say that this process, uh, there is, there's been some studies showing that this capacity of mitochondria to generate PMF and therefore generate EP is declining with aging. So this is already one good thing. Secondly, a lot of the targets, or a lot of the not targets, a lot of the interventions to increase lifespan target this process. Uh, mito UPR and so on. Um, if you target these complexes, you can have an increase of lifespan. Um, and so one, one, one target, one rationale is to target it because it's been successful before and maybe it needs help to generate energy. But on the other side of the coin, if you think about it, we take nutrients and use oxygen to burn these nu nutrients in the mitochondria to generate energy. In very much analogy to uh, uh, factory that takes, if it wants to generate electricity, it takes carbon, burn it with oxygen to generate electricity. And by doing so, I don't need to tell you, but you can see it really clearly here, you generate waste, a lot of toxic waste. And the same principle in the mitochondria, when you generate energy, you also generate waste, which when we are young, it's maybe more easy for us to get rid of, but as we get old, it accumulates. And this is bad. So I was thinking, what kind of tool can increase our ATP production, but also decrease the waste production? And for this, um, I was looking around um, and I saw this really two interesting papers. You don't need to look at all the data, but this is from Israel Cycle Lab in the Ben Gurion University. And what they did is they used light. So they took a channel, they took a channel which is light activated and they did something really nice. Um, they took this uh, bacterial or fungal protein and they taught it how to reach the mitochondria. And when you take this protein that was never before in evolution in the mitochondria and you force it to be there, um, you can shine light and you can control mitochondrial activity. The problem with this is this is, this is a channel. So if you activate it with lights, you cause depolarization. 
And this is not really what I wanted. I wanted to actually cause polarization. And there was another paper um, um, by Samuel here, um, and he made this artificial organelle and he took uh, a pump, a pump, a light activated pump that does the opposite of the channel. Now, if you take light and you, um, you activate this, this pump, you can increase the uh, uh, proton gradient. And by doing so, if it's coupled to ATP synthase, you can increase ATP production. So this is the experiment here. If you uh, add this uh, light activated channels, you can have an increase of the delta pH, so more protons. And if you add now um, the ATP synthase subunits, you can increase ATP. So very, very important. They showed you can put light and generate from light ATP. So converting light into matter or chemical energy. And so when I saw this paper, I wanted to combine these two, uh, these two, the best of two worlds. I wanted to have this light pump going inside uh, in vivo in mitochondria, being that that has been shown in, in vitro. And um, we had actually these two constructs, but luckily, because I say luckily, because it would have taken years to do this. Um, luckily, someone else has already done it. And this is what Andrew Wojtovich lab has uh, generated this really beautiful tool, which I'm going to talk about. Uh, it was peer-edited by Brandon Berry. He was a postdoc back then, and now he's a, he went to do postdoc in the University of Washington. And they really did some brilliant experiments showing, well, if you have the mitochondria, you have the electron transport chain to generate the proton gradient and then ATP via ATP synthase, we are going to uh, put uh, this light-activated uh, proton pump called Mito-On. And this Mito-On works if uh, they... they placed it exactly in the intermembrane uh, uh, membrane. Um, and they showed that if you put light in a core factor called all trans retinol, please remember all, the, all trans retinol for the next slide, ATR, you can activate and basically replace some of the need of the electron transport chain. It was published in Ember Reports in 2020. Someone posted it on Twitter. I was shocked when I saw it and I thought, beautiful. And the next day I was already emailing Andrew uh, Wojtovich yeah, I need to mention he's also from Rochester University. And I said to him, we have to collaborate on aging. This is, this is going to be amazing. And um, luckily he agreed. So this is from the Ember Reports paper. And you can see again, this proof of principle that if you shine lights plus ATR, the cofactor, you can have uh, ATP out of nothing. So not out of nothing, ATP, ADP to ATP, but, they, but, but without this ATR or without the light, there is no production of ATP. Um, and when you uh, put intact mitochondria, you can also do this uh, also with less oxygen, which is great because oxygen can produce, for instance, reactive oxygen species. So the next thing, this is where our collaboration starts, is can it be implemented on aging? And to do this, uh, we took worms and we took four different conditions. So uh, it's important that we put uh, no light and then we put with and without ATR to really show ATR is not antioxidant or something that can increase lifespan. And we also shine light on the worms. So if I forgot to mention, we took worms with this mite on, and the light is at 590 nanometers, which has allowed the excitation of the light uh, proton pump. And the question was very simple. Can we increase lifespan? All this, all this theory I showed you the last 18 minutes, does it really uh, support it by that? And the answer is yes. So if you take these four conditions of uh, light and dark, so this is the dark and uh, this is the light, with and without ATR, you can clearly see a substantial increase of lifespan of this mitoon activated worms, um, suggesting that the mitoon really increased lifespan. So it's, I think, the first time that, ever, that someone ever shown that you can take light, shine it, and affect the mitochondrial activity directly to increase lifespan. And not only lifespan, but it's also, you need to be mindful that when you increase lifespan, it can come on the expense of your fitness. So you can maybe make very sluggish ones that don't do move much and they live longer, but what kind of life is that? And here you can see not only that they live longer, they have also improved activity compared to their control. So this is good. We generate uh, uh, ones that live longer and they're also more uh, physically active. That's great. Um, we also um, tested some different intensities of light, and we showed if we take, uh, we call it a normal intensity or the standard intensity, there is an increase of lifespan. 
Whereas if the light is too low, so um, the intensity is very low, this uh, beneficial increase uh, is really kind of abrogated. So you cannot really see it. So it's really dependent on the light and the light intensity. Um, as a proof of principle, we also show that if you add FCCP, so this is um, a reagent that decreases the PMF, not completely abolish it because then they will die, just in the right amount to decrease it. If you add FCCP, you can see that uh, also this improved enhanced lifespan is also gone, suggesting that this PMF is really a key um, factor in determining here the longevity. Okay, the other thing is, because we were so convinced we... Um, we did something very novel. We also wanted to combine it with known intervention to extend lifespan. Um, and one of them that we chose is uh, activated AMPK, which has, which, which has been shown by William Mayer and others to increase lifespan. And you can nicely see that when you combine Myton with active AMPK, you have an additive effect of increased lifespan. And this is something we really would like to follow is to test other canonical ways to increase lifespan and see if our uh, Myton can further uh, increase it. And so just to summary, uh, very simply, I already talked about it, that uh, the light can increase lifespan and health span in mitochondria. Of course, uh, we'll talk soon about the changes, but one question I always get is, okay, worms, who cares? What's, what's up? Like in, uh, in, you know, to the real thing, we want to do it in human eventually. So we are still far away from that. But as a proof of principle, Andrew Wojtovich and his colleagues, and this is uh, a study I have nothing to do with, um, they show that as proof of principle, you can also transfect mammalian cells with myton, and it also works. So if you look at HeLa cells from human or CD cells uh, in mice, and I invite you to look at this paper, um, so you can see that the colorization is very nicely into the mitochondria. So this is very important to make sure this protein goes to the mitochondria. I think this is one of the most hurdles technologically wise. And they show this proof of principle that be it um, human cell or, uh, or, or a mouse cell, you can increase the ATP levels simply by activating myton with light, uh, which is, I think, quite good um, starting point for future experiments um, in mammalian system. And so maybe to summary, um, to summary of all, all my data is um, the implications of mitochondrial in aging. So, in early phases of aging, I think it's possible that metabolism is hyperactive and generate too much toxic waste. Um, but in late phases of aging, um, we, we have a damage in the mitochondria and reduction of ATP production, mitochondrial dysfunction, and the myton might address both of them. First of all, by reducing um, uh, the, the waste production, using clean, clean energy like solar energy. And this is really the energy replacement concept. We don't seek really necessarily to increase ATP levels. We want to replace the way it's been made. So instead of the cell investing 100% of its metabolic activity to make ATP, now give it, I only need 70% to, to invest to do ATP. Other 30 will come from light. So I'll have much less damage. I need to invest less in this. So this is the concept of partial energy replacement. And in the same time, when needs to, um, when the animal is old enough, then you need to make a compensation and uh, increase the ATP levels by ATP activity, then it also can be done. And I suspect it also can be done by changing the light intensity. So this is the model. And I just want to talk about also in the last one and something minute that I have um, about the limitations of this technology. Nothing is gold uh, without any price. So. First of all, it's clear at the moment it's, uh, it's gene therapy. So the delivery has to be accordingly. It's, you, you need the gene therapy. It's not uh, a drug like some nice rapamycin and so on. You just swallow. So it will be involved in gene therapy. There is this big question about light accessibility. So, okay, there are some obvious things like the skin that we can target, but what about the brain? What about the heart? What about other uh, liver, uh, other organisms, uh, other uh, um organs. And this is something we are really keenly working on. Uh, I think it's very important to address it. Toxicity assessment. We don't want to end up like vampires hiding from the light because it's going to generate too much uh, PMF. So this is also something that needs to be adjusted uh, or to understand how much light is needed. And this is not going to, if everything pans out, it's not likely to be uh, a magic one pill and that it, it's probably likely to be chronic treatment. And I hope it stems from the understanding here 
that it's lifelong reduction or attenuation of waste accumulation. So it's likely to be chronic treatment. And with this, <clears throat> again, I want to thank the organizers um, for giving me the opportunity to talk to so many people. Uh, I want to take uh, to thank uh, um, my lab. We just made this picture yesterday. Some people are still not happy with this, so maybe we'll make another round. Uh, thank for all my collaborations, my postdoc supervisors, and uh, really, I would like to take uh, to thank Andrew Vojtovich and Brendan Berry. Uh, they let me join this crazy ride with the Myton, and I really uh, feel very passionate about it. So thank you very much for. It. Oh, and the last thing. I would like to really make a special thank for the impetus grant. I mean, as you can see between the lines, this project is a bit crazy. And it was very difficult to get uh, funding for this kind of project, but impetus grant really uh, believed in us and I hope they don't regret um, funding us. And uh, yeah, it's obvious that we need more funding to go forward with this crazy idea. So thank you very much for your attention. Looking forward for discussion and questions. Great, thank you so much. I think what we heard is a new human solar panel. <laughs> it's, uh, it's absolutely great. Um, you, you already mentioned that everything has a little bit of, of a side effect. Um, if I look at our skin, we are aging because of light exposure, uh, et cetera, UV light. So have you thought about the side effects also in terms of what kind of light to use, what kind of links, etc.? So tell me a little bit more. Light in principle, we think is not good. We love it, uh, but exposing cells might be quite dangerous. Yeah, this is the times. Uh, it's a really good question. This is the times I, I was wishing Andrew was he here with me. I believe that the light, this harmful light that you're referring to, is more in the short range, like the violet. And I think this is the light that is not targeted by um, by our uh, Myton. It's 590, so it's close to yellow, almost red, but still yellow. So this light uh, has not been shown to be harmful. Uh, there has been papers showing with the short live uh, wavelengths, such as um, the violet and the blue, they actually have shorter lifespan uh, of the worms. This is Dylan and Rudin's lab and, and colleagues. So we are still on the safe side. I think they did not, we didn't observe with the yellow light any reduction or any apparent damage. But of course, if you will go to the shorter wavelength, that would be a problem for the skin. So we hope, or the vision would be, uh, you still will need to put your sunscreen, but it will still allow the 590 uh, to go through. Or oh, this is the, 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 let's go the other way around, maybe not the cream, but we will have, at least maybe I didn't show it, when we have the worms, we have uh, a very specific wavelength beneath them, only the yellow light, so nothing around it. Otherwise, there's no light supplementation. Okay, so, so might that be also dependent on what kind of cell type you are testing and if that cell might be younger or older, already senescent, et cetera, uh, if there might be more side effects and, um, of UV, but you say of, 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 the, of the light. Is, that, is there a difference between cells? Uh, I didn't think about it, to be honest, and it's always good to get such a question. I didn't think if there would be difference in... Um, different cell types, that's a really good uh, thing to, to think about. We so far did it on, only on simple worms and maybe in other organisms or egg cells, but I didn't think about the different necessity. That's something we really need to test, maybe to understand better what is the ATP requirements. Um, or, or, or in another way, actually, we start uh, maybe to think about it in this direction. It would be good to combine this with something that removes senescent cells, and then maybe it will make our lives a bit easier. That, that's a good idea. Um, I think removing cells already is a is a is a hurdle, <laughs> but let's see. Um, so you you already said okay, it's it's not yet there. So, so you won't have a pill. There is uh, gene editing involved, etc. What, what about CRISPR cas etc. There is so much involvement of, at the moment of geneticists into also the aging field, but especially disease related field to target uh, specific organs. So hypothesize a little bit how future therapeutics could look like. Yeah, I think we'll. I think there will be the first step that we will target them specifically to cells that are accessible to light, like the skin. Yeah. And uh, well, for the inner organs, I think it's completely different direction, which I cannot talk at the moment. It's way too early. It's not really about CRISPR and how you edit it. It's how you make really the light accessible inside. That's I think the biggest hurdle. We have a couple of even more crazy ideas, and I hope in the next year and a half I can share. Um, and then maybe it will make more sense how we tackle it. Um, 
But of course, at the beginning, it will be good only to do um, the obvious organs like skin. Um, this is something we really want to go forward with. Uh, we, are, we actually already started a collaboration in this direction with the skin. Let me ask you a little bit of a challenging question. So you, you showed that lifespan extension of C. elegans. If I compare that with other jurors therapeutics, it's round about the same, isn't it? In terms of the effect size. So do you think that your miton will be much, much better compared to other therapeutics? Because you ask your students, come up with really crazy ideas and let's really extend lifespan. So do you have any idea why you just got that little bit lifespan extension and you're not there and you might go back to your, your students? <laughs> Yeah, that's fantastic observation. Um, I think, again, everyone, I have a feeling in general in aging, everyone has their own, you know, uh, little uh, niche that, oh, my okay, same treatment is the best. My senolytic is the best. I I'm not going to uh, promote it too much. I think the idea is, uh, first, you need to bear in mind, this myton is still a very new concept. And what I show you, I think, is very, very far from optimization. And I'm not talking only about the light, um, the light intensity. So my initial hypothesis, and that maybe will surprise you, was that this experiment is not going to work. I thought, well, the idea is to make energy replacement, but we let these uh, worms just eat as much as they want. So they eat and they have the myton. I think um, one critical optimization is we need to limit the food uh, source. So we need, to we need to reduce the amount of food they eat so they generate like, less waste and really use this myton a bit more. So just maybe to summarize it, I'm not saying this is the next big thing. I think it's a crazy uh, idea, but I think uh, we we really, at the beginning, we need a lot of optimization, whereas rapamycin and other techniques have been for a long time investigated by many labs, but we are thinking now, okay, we showed as a proof of principle, we can increase lifespan. How can we optimize it? That's a big step. And what is also the implication of more complex organism than, um, than worms? So that's one thing. And another thing is in the context of disease, even if aging, it will not prove the next slam dunk, the next big thing, there are lots of clear implications how we can use myton in metabolic diseases where people are born with uh, errors in metabolism and cannot produce enough FTP. So it's not just the lifespan, it's also enabling someone to live normally that has deficit. So it's really fresh from the oven. I think there's a lot of room for improvement here. I, I really love it. It's absolutely not a criticism because it's so nice mm. to not talk about repurposed drugs and supplements, etc. And we are not talking about solar energy and really using uh, that sort of concept uh, for ourselves. Um, so you already showed in one of your experiments, which was great, that you were combining uh, the, um, the, the, the interventions. So could you also a little bit hypothesize what a next experiment would look like, uh, for example, in, in animal models to give the myton, but also then stimulate mitochondrial function even further? I'm thinking about EKG, your A, et cetera, other supplements. Have you thought about that? We thought about it just a little bit. Um, we, we thought we, we, we really focus on uh, the canonical ways, as for instance, rapamycin and other drugs that we know work, uh, or metformin. Um, but it's hard to, I'm not sure how much I can talk about because it's still in the process. We are thinking about it. And the AMPK was just some sort of uh, easy starting experiment. But of course, we think how to combine. I, I also even think that this is the way to go to try to combine it. As I said, obviously, caloric intervention is something that must be coupled with mite on. There are drugs, and we have some other crazy ideas, but I think we just need to wait a bit longer until it's uh, ready to, to, to be shared. Yeah, okay. Conservative answer, that's good. <laughs> oh, sorry. Um, Sometimes I have done conservatives. Tell me, why did your, your, your students not coming up with hibernation? Because that's really related, decreasing your, your metabolism, etc. And... Uh, any idea if you could get animals out of hibernation while giving the myton? I never thought about it. I don't know why the student, because the student should be more creative than the group leader, right? They are younger. I haven't thought about the hibernation. It's something I cannot really give any meaningful answer. Um, 
because I am not knowledgeable about hibernation whatsoever, I didn't think about that. So maybe later we can discuss and you can explain how do you see Maiton with hibernation? That's interesting. Yes, absolutely. It's a little bit coming from, we did lots of clinical studies in humans where we looked at resting metabolic rates and we thought, okay, the resting metabolic rates will be much, much lower in individuals who are long living. Uh, exactly the concept you say, because you have less transliptional noise, et cetera, et cetera. But we really couldn't find that in, in humans. So there might be other processes next to um, in, in differences in metabolism really driving it. Which brings me to my last um, uh, question. Um, and it's related to my, my earlier one. In terms of an effect size, how much do you think is the human aging process really an ATP problem? Um, there was a, it's a complex question. Good, that's the last one. Uh, there, there, I mean, there has been like the science paper from last year by John Speakman showing that there is some age that energy production or usage is decreasing. How much is an essential problem? I actually do not know. Um, I think it's more, I actually like more, we can, we can think about the different manners, but I think like, I like this um, um, waste accumulation, like lipofusine and all these aggregates. I think this is where uh, maybe the mitone will be more beneficial. I think cells are very adaptable and they can generate, they can adjust to generate more ATP when they need it. I think, again, the problem is when they do so, they generate more waste, which the cell cannot think 20 years ahead, aha, if I generate more ATP now, in 20 years, I'm going to suffer and I will have more waste and then I cannot deal with this anymore. So I think this is where the real money with the uh, myton is to uh, attenuate the waste accumulation. I mean, if you see a picture, if I may make the same presentation as you and put pictures of me, I think I'll have lipofocene accumulation. I can already think about it now. And the question is, it seemed to be a bad thing. It seems that age people have more accumulation of waste, waste. So I assume that myton reduction of waste would be very beneficial. It's not really about generating more ATPs. It's, as I said, replacing how you generate it. So the problem maybe is waste and not ATP directly. It's because we accumulate waste while generating ATP. Maybe that would be my best answer. Okay, great. But I have a it, it little one. You started and I was shocked by it. You are separating the head of flies. And then you are measuring the oxygen consumption, but then you are dead. How that is that working? And then we are going to the questions of the audience, going to Grace. Yeah, that's, I think, one of the biggest difference between mammals and invertebrates. So if my head is uh, separated from my body, that's it. That's the end of the road. But I remember when I was PhD or master's student in Gettingen, uh, the zoology professor came and cut the head of a cricket. And then he said, you see the cricket? It's still alive. And then he make it fly up the air and the cricket still flies. It's still alive. It's starving to death, but not because it loses blood or the different system. So the heads, when you remove it, um, the heads consume oxygen for a couple of hours and they happily eat glucose, not realizing the body is gone. So you can manipulate it. I didn't put in the presentation. The idea was that isolated mitochondria do not represent physiological conditions as much as the whole tissue. I can tell you we are not translating that from the animal models to the humans. So over to uh, Grace Kay, um, a research assistant at our Center for Health Longevity. What is the audience asking um, to Shahaf? Yeah, so thank you, Andrea, for the introduction and Dr. Pellick for the interesting presentation. Today, we have a few questions from the audience. So let's start with this question. For those single cell organisms which use light directly, like algae, do they use the same protein or a more complicated mechanism? I mean, uh, well, that cannot ask the person that they, uh, and that asked the question. Do they mean like chloroplasts? Because this is way more complex. Or they mean, uh, that person, please just write me a direct email and I can answer. Um, I guess there are different uh, light-activated light proton pumps, uh, for instance, in bacteria and fungi, and um, they actually usually on the membrane, outer membrane of the cell, um, maintaining pH. As for algae, the, please ask the person to write me. And I'm not an expert of algae anyway, so I mean, maybe you can discuss it. Sorry. Okay, there are also a few questions regarding the use of optogenetics. So considering that optogenetics require gene editing, how translatable do you think this technology is to humans? Yeah. I think uh, Andrea and I already covered this slightly, but I think um, 
There are some organs, and if you look closely in the literature, there are some organs that can be used even in human for gene editing. And these are also the organs that I think can have the applicability for mito on. Uh, I think it will be targeted only on specific organs that are uh, accessible for light at the beginning. But I think it's nothing really with the mito on. It seems like it's already been approved to use gene therapy in some specific organs. So this will be the starting point. In the future, uh, in a provocative Suggestion, I think the only way to really meaningfully increase lifespan, and again, I'm just provoking here, will be through gene editing. I think there is a glass ceiling of drugs and exercise that we can move forward. We need to radically change something basic in us to move forward, but it's provocative. It's maybe wrong. It's just my opinion. So uh, the next questions are relating to mito on. So um, did you check or have you considered the impact of mito on on epigenetics, uh, for example, histone acetylation levels? Thank you very much for some for the person who asked this question. It's one of my aims in my upcoming grant. Um, I'm not sure. Well, okay, so there are two two ways to look at it. Uh, if you rewire metabolism uh, like that, so you generate TP through light, there will be metabolic changes which you still did not look for, and that will obviously change the metabolite levels that will affect the histone modification. That's great. It looks as if when we activate mitochondria, there is no harmful effect, so we don't mess up completely. Uh, uh, the, the epigenome, so the animals are sick and die. And then there is another thing you can think, not the direct effect, but the indirect effect. Um, if you really make an animal live longer, can you also impact the whole max of aging, such of epigenetic? So this is two things, and I think it's a really good idea, and I'm really glad someone asked it. So my aim, I think I'm more confident about writing this aim. Uh, so the next question is, uh, do you think there's a gender difference with regards to the response in using optogenetics to improve mitochondrial function in aged preclinical animals? Age difference. So we only did one so far. Um, we don't know. It's something, um, anything I say will be data-free observation. So I guess uh, if there is a sexual dimorphism of myton, it's something need to be tested, perhaps um, need to be checked. I mean, I remember a paper from Nature um, showing ovarian aging and how ovaries um, or, or eggs um, can, can really um, reduce or block one of the complex, complex one, I think, and that somehow make the cells live longer or survive longer. And I think, well, from the ovaries, it's obviously going to be different. Uh, but I think I don't know the answers for the rest. It needs to be tested. So um, did you express mito on in any tissue-specific manner or is it constitutive? Or, uh, and if it is tissue specific, which tissues show increased function? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, sorry if I forgot to mention, it's the whole body of the womb and we haven't done yet uh, tissue specific, but obviously it's something that sh should be done to determine if some cells are more important or less important or that's something that still needs to be done. I show you something that is really fresh of the oven. So we started this project during Corona time around middle of, 2020. So that's as far as we went. So we have an interesting question here. Uh, it says, so we understand that this mito-on tool helps to increase the proton gradient across the mitochondrial membrane, which usually declines with aging. But what if there's an overactivation of mito-on by light? Would there be any detrimental consequences on lifespan? I would assume that yes. I assume that if you overactivate it, it will be harmful. So um, that's why it's very important to control also how much light, so it's not too much light. Uh, I assume it will also affect the acidicity. And uh, that's a question that may be more suitable to uh, ask to Andrew directly, Wojtovic. So the person that asks can also write maybe Andrew directly and ask or, or Brandon Berry uh, on Twitter. So um, another question is, light is known to entrain circadian rhythms. So under what light regimes were the worms raised in? Yeah, I think that's a very good uh, point. So with the worms, actually, I think me and Andrew, and Andrea, Andrew, Andrea also uh, covered it a bit, uh, that some light is uh, harmful for uh, worms. So worms usually hide in the soil and they don't really want to have light. Um, we just did 24-7. But with other organisms we are currently working on, we are doing um, circadian regime, so 12-12. So maybe we can move on to a more general question. Uh, someone is curious, uh, what are some of the major causes for mitochondrial function to decline during aging? Yeah, I think that's a uh, not easy answer to, <laughs> not easy question to answer. Uh, there are lots of reviews about it. Again, I think it's multifunctional um, 
There was also a very nice uh, review in cell metabolism by Martin Picard illustrating how complex mitochondria is beyond just energy production. So this question should be really for the experts. As I mentioned, one of them is the toxic wastes, uh, the ROS production, lipofacine accumulation, um, that this waste is somehow causing... Um, you can think about your house. If you don't clean, if you don't take the waste, um, it will be harder to live in this house. Um, this is just, I think, there is no good answer, like a simple answer to I think it's uh, probably a whole course just to discuss what we know so far about it. Uh, another question is, are there any natural ways to improve mitochondrial function during aging instead of taking drugs or supplements? Well, I think that's what we covered at the beginning with the exercise that I would assume uh, live healthy, exercise, be happy, do things that you like, and don't be under constant stress. I guess this is uh, will improve your life. Uh, maybe we can have one last question. I think you kind of covered it a little bit, but uh, to summarize, what would be some of the major challenges or limitations of using optogenetics to improve mitochondrial function decline during aging in order to improve lifespan and health span in humans? Yeah. I think, again, first is the optimization, so to make sure it's not harmful, uh, to make sure how we make it optimal. And the second is really how to make it accessible to light. I mean, nobody wants worms to live longer. We definitely don't want it in our home uh, or elsewhere. Uh, we need to understand how it can be inducible inside our body. This is, I think, I consider the most major challenge at the moment because we can optimize as much as we want in worms, but the question is, well, we want humans, we want to have human intervention. So we have a couple of ideas. It's quite challenging, but but I think it, it might be possible to do it. If not, we will just be limited to skin and, you know, et cetera. But I think this is not sufficient to, we really want to be, to make it accessible also in the organs inside. So I think this is the major challenge. Thank you so much. I have a last question because it might be um, that we, we are not dying because of skin aging. I think we are worried about our, our look, uh, but most of the time that's not the, the, the limiting uh, uh, factor, uh, of course. Um, do you think that there will be a therapy in the next 10 years out of this product? It depends on the funding, really. I think the ideas are there. The start, the basis is there. Um, we just need working hands to test this hypothesis. I think it's possible. Um, yeah, I think it's possible. I mean, again, I'm not saying it will work. I'm not saying um, it's the best next thing ever. Uh, Altos Labs or, you know, we will we'll want to buy it and so on, like, uh, you know, with the OKSM. But um, I think it's possible. Um, I have a feeling that, the, I mean, this is kind of um, a high risk, high reward uh, research. And I think um, it will be possible, especially if we make it accessible to light inside. I think it's a very attractive idea to generate clean energy. Um, and I think this is one of the way to go. I'm not saying this is the way and forget everything else. Nothing else is cool. It's just one small idea that can contribute uh, to longevity. Absolutely. Thank you so much. It was such an enlightening, really nice, nice talk. Um, talking differently about the aging process. Thank you so much and wishing you all the best uh, and get lots of grants to actually <laughs> to uh, prove your ideas. I think uh, this might have triggered lots of other questions. So please still uh, put them in the chat. Uh, you might also want to uh, give us some advice who next should be our speaker. So please use the panelists and all that in this uh, option to leave all the comments, maybe criticism, that's fine. We will work on it and the feedback. If you want to participate in one of our studies, yeah, that's doable because we have two open studies at this moment in time. We're actively recruiting Malay and Indians, if you're living in Singapore, for our ABIO study. And we just opened the recruitment of our ABLE study, testing the effect of alpha-ketoglutarate. So if you're 40 to 60 and you're healthy or you know somebody, please sign up. And you will also then know your biological age because that is our screening momentum. The next episode will be on the 19th of January uh, this year. And my guest will be Associate Professor Saji Kumar Sridharan, and he will talk about age-related changes of the hippocampus and cognition. 
I will leave you as always with a final video. I can tell you I will not do what that individual is really doing, uh, but I will be a little bit on the treadmill later this evening. Take care. I'm having a blast running. Every day is a new adventure. Last year I did 43 races in 40 weekends. Actually, I told my wife when I retired, I, you know, I'm not gonna run all the time. I already run as much as I could, but I was so wrong. I'd always resisted hiring a coach because he's gonna tell you how to run. Who doesn't know how to run? He said, well, obviously I'm getting old. If I wanna get a new PR, I'll have to take a chance. Don't do cross training, stretching, special diets, none of that stuff. I always tell people I just run. If it gets to the point where I can't beat times anymore, I have my own personal metric that I keep for trail runs, which is the oldest known finisher. I have five or six, seven races now where uh, nobody older has ever finished the race. Of course, as I get older, that gets easier. My ultimate goal is to win the 120 age group in Boston somewhere. I'm feeling like sunshine, like springtime, like something's in the water and I'm taking a deep dive. I'm feeling so weightless Like I'm gonna make it And nothing in the universe can take this I can see it clearly now Nothing gonna bring me down